Hi, everybody. Welcome to the final day of Food Allergy Awareness Week, and welcome to the Eating at a Meeting podcast live. I am your host, Tracy Stuckraff, Eating at a Meeting, Thrive Meetings and Events. And all week long, we've been here with fabulous guests talking about different aspects of food allergies. Kristen Osborne was here on Monday, and then we had Ruth on Tuesday and Amanda on Wednesday. And Kyle, I'm glad, and I've got Carolyn and you're my token male. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad that I have you on here. Um, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me as the anchor in this food allergy awareness relay this week. I, I know it's been great. I mean, there's so many facets of, of food allergies and everybody Kyle is, I've followed him for years and he is a food allergy like icon in the food allergy world, but he is a social entrepreneur who founded Equal Eats, which is a company that helps people travel safer with dietary restrictions. He's a food allergy educator. He performs allergy awareness assemblies and all week long, he's been singing about food allergies to thousands of people all week. Um, and he's uh, performed at over 900 schools globally, which is so awesome. So thank you, Kyle. My pleasure. It's a busy week for everybody, but uh, that's Food Allergy Awareness Week for you. It's a great time it to is. There, raise awareness it is. and and you know we deal with this every day, so it's a great I, great time to share that. Okay, so actually, because of that last thing about the schools, and you've been singing all week, do you are you you're not singing just to kids who have food allergies? You're singing to entire schools, teaching them about food allergies. Is that right? That's why I do what I do. You know, it's 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 trying to reach kids that have never received this message before, or maybe they received it through, you know, a television show or another way. And it's really trying to help kids get the right information in an age appropriate way. So when I talk to, you know, students that don't have food allergies, it's really trying to help them understand what allergies are all about, how they can help with not sharing food at school, washing their mm -hmm. hands, taking it seriously, and overall just developing empathy for differences. So, I just wish when I was growing up, the kids around me were a little bit more empathetic about, you know, this thing that made me different. Because you've got, you've had food allergies since you, you were two, or known since two, and they're shellfish, peanuts, tree nuts, mustard, and, oh, now I'm going to forget the fifth one. Uh, do we say peanuts? Yeah, peanuts, egg. tree nuts, egg, egg. <laughs> peanuts, yeah. tree nuts, eggs, shellfish, and mustard. Yeah. And you knew that since you, your mom has known that since you were two and you as well, but. Yeah, it was before food allergies were kind of a thing. I, you know, it was the <laughs> mid eighties, mid eighties diagnosis. So a lot has changed since then, but I've had a few allergies come. I've had a few allergies go, but consistently I've had life threatening allergies since mid eighties, mid eighties. Wow. And then for everybody to know your wife has celiac disease. Yeah. So I wasn't like looking for that when we <laughs> I wasn't targeting a, a dietary restriction, but uh, <laughs> we really found in the early stages that this connection, when we dined out, we both had this thing where uh, dining out was tricky and finding safe food was tricky and we both love travel. And we found that we both have each other's back through that. So it's, it's kind of been nice and we have this crazy setup in our kitchen to keep each other safe, um, uh -huh. but, but it works. Well, and that's good. And earlier in this week, we we did talk about dating because it, it's kind of hard. I mean, when do you tell somebody that you have, oh, these food allergies and and then what is their reaction going to be? You know, not just your potential anaphylactic reaction, but what's their reaction going to be like, oh, my gosh, I don't want to deal with that trouble. Right. Right. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the sooner the better, I always think, get it out of the way with right. and, and then they know and then you're going to see how they react, whether it's, you know, no big deal. And I remember from back in the day when I, when I used to, to date, it wasn't so much partner, it was the partner's family as well. That was part of that equation too, because there's the meet the family dinner, which is already awkward, right? And then when there's the allergies on top of it, I, mm -hmm. I remember one time I just really wish I told them in advance because I couldn't eat anything and it made it really awkward. I'm sure, yeah, because you, you're like, <laughs> uh, thanks, but I, I can't eat that, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna die. be rude. I want to put a nice impression out there, but right. I'm coming off the wrong way here. <laughs> okay, so let's get back to um, food out. I mean, not we're we're still talking about food allergies, but the way I pitched this and the way I want to talk about it is before you started, before it was called Equal Eats, it was called what? It was called Allergy Translation. 
Okay. Go ahead and explain that. Yeah. And essentially it was a business I started when I was at university uh, as a, as a marketing project. And oh, wow. really, uh, it started because I, I had a really tough time when I was traveling, uh, backpacking around in my early 20s. I remember being in Morocco and just realizing I didn't prepare for this at all. Uh, I, I, I don't speak Arabic. I can't read Arabic. Uh -huh. uh, and it was just very difficult for me to eat anything safe and communicate. So um, being kind of the last minute guy I was, I wanted to create a service that you could at least have your allergies translated very quickly. So you could, you know, you get it on a trip, get it the night before. And, and that was allergy translation. And uh, within the last couple of years, I went back to school, got a master's degree. And again, go, through going to university, restarted this business as Equal Eats with a lot of lessons learned of how we could do this even better. Okay, so that's where I, I'm like, what does it, what does the word equal eats mean? And I think I've told you this before. I'm like, I'm so mad that I didn't think of that name because I think I, I love the name. And it's about diversity and equity and inclusion, in, in my opinion. But tell the audience about where that came from, how you came to that name. Yeah, equal eats. <clears throat> and essentially, um, I think for everybody who has a food allergy, and at least most people I know, we've almost become conditioned to feel like a burden through mm -hmm. so many negative experiences, through dining out and through social issues and whatnot. And, and that has become an issue of equality where you go to a restaurant and you don't feel um, that you're on the on an equal dining field as everybody else. It's not a normal experience like everybody around you is having. So our goal is really to try to make it an inclusive environment to make you feel that you're not a burden, that you are totally normal, uh, even though you have a dietary restriction. And the, uh, the other goal with the name is it's not just food allergy uh, that, that should have all the attention. You know, my wife has celiac disease. I know people with different intolerances and special diets that they keep for medical reasons. It's very important. So. Uh, essentially, we all deserve an equal seat at the table, regardless of the dietary restrictions. And, and that's kind of been the bedrock of, of the Equal Eats. Well, and that's how when I'm speaking too, to, to meeting planners and, and caterers is that whether it's a food allergy, a different medical condition, a religious based practice or a personal preference because of life's, you know, medical. Well, I already said medical, but for, you know, lifestyle or environmental reasons, we all should be able to eat. Yeah. And, and enjoy food. And I think that's a big thing too, where it's a lot of people, I think in a lot of people in our community, it's a very complicated relationship with food because of trust and, and not enough information about what's, what you're putting in your mouth. And when you can get to that level where you know, and you have certainty, you can enjoy food like everybody else does. So that that's really a goal is trying to break down those barriers so we can just enjoy food and, and everywhere across the world. That's, that's so important. And, and from the original rendition to now you've got it in plastic cards, right? Size cards. This is not yeah. a size card, but cards that you yeah. showed earlier. Yep. And then you also have an app. We have an app. Yeah. So it, it, we're trying to marry the two, two worlds of old school, new yeah. school. There, there you go. You get the app <laughs> and you can toggle through languages right on the app because not everyone has a wallet these days. Not mm -hmm. everyone has plastic so every almost everyone has a phone so we're trying to at least cover our bases mm -hmm. but research told us for years is how much people want a plastic card and and part of the reason is it's this professional you know credit card size card that you're giving in a food service setting that whoop, that speaks their language it's being taken seriously it's in mm -hmm. their language and from just design testing, when we were using cards in restaurants and phones, often we'd find that they want to bring the card, the message to the chef in the kitchen. And not yeah. too many people want to give up the phone, uh, especially right. when you're in a foreign country versus the card. Yeah, take it, show it, but you know, right. bring it back too. So it has its advantages, but in a pinch, the phone is great as well, just to get the message out there. So in all of your research in doing that and designing it, what were your biggest ahas from the diner's perspective as well as the kitchen's perspective? Oh, we're out of sync. We're completely yeah. out of sync on a lot of the, uh, on what we want to communicate as diners 
and what they need to hear as food service staff. Communication. And, yeah. Right. And it, it all comes back to that. Like I, I always think people think allergies, they think peanuts, but the biggest cause, if you look at all the research and studies of allergic reactions is miscommunication. And it's all coming back to that transfer of information. And what we tell someone like a teacher or, you know, camp counselor is, is one thing. And sometimes that message goes into food service settings. So we found there was a big disconnect there where especially a lot of loaded messaging, which is if this is your style, if you want to say severity and make uh, analogies to it's a loaded gun or something like this, that's not my uh -huh. style. Um, but then in terms of food service staff, they don't need to necessarily hear what scale it is in your mind. They need to know what it is. Is it allergy? Is it intolerance? Is it celiac? And then what is it to? What are the allergens? And then that's empowering them with the information and they can use the system at that point. Because I think a lot of diners think we can kind of get into their system mm -hmm. and start to, to control it a bit. But if you're going to a good place, they should have it already in place. And, and yeah. That. And that's what, that's what um, Carolyn and Jackie were saying on Thursday is like, you have to have the systems in place so that you can, you can, manage it safely in the back of the house and in the front of the house. Exactly. And it's our job as a, as a diner to just disclose mm -hmm. is to be right. transparent about what we've got. And then they can be transparent about what they do. And we right. can then make that decision of, do we feel comfortable or not? But um, it's a bit of a dance and we're still kind of a little bit awkward in it from both sides. Right. We're getting yeah. there. Well, and then in my world of meeting planning, you've got, the meeting planner, me asking you what your needs are, and it prints out on an Excel spreadsheet. And then I'm sending that to a convention services manager who's then sending that to the chef, right? And like two weeks ago, I had a group of 550 people and we had 30 people with dietary restrictions, but I've worked an event that had 683 people. Wow. So that's that communication is key. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I, I would assume, too, that I've been to, to meetings and conferences mm -hmm. where people didn't disclose in advance and they show up expecting some type right. of on the fly solution, mm -hmm. for them, which is not fair for anybody. Um, you, you have to follow your process as a diner. Right. You can help them as a food service operator. Yeah. And so. It, well, all right, I want to go back to the intolerance thing, because a lot of the questions I get from meeting planners as well is or and, and from chefs is like, well, how do I know what do is it a is it a want? Is it a need? You know, and how do I treat them? And I'm like, I say treat them the same way. And do, in, the, in your research, are you are you finding that or do they want to I mean, doing the safety aspect of them in the back of the house, I would say it would be the same. It, essentially, it, it should be in terms of how, you know, there's a lot of standardized things of how you right. store your ingredients and, and labeling right. the supply chain. Um, it, really, it, there might be some differences with cross-contamination, uh, mm -hmm. cross-contact procedures in a kitchen. But ultimately, if you're flagging a meal as special dietary restriction, uh, it, it sh to make your life simple, it should be a very standardized procedure where it's right. not going from this is this, this is this, this is for this restriction. Make right. your life easier across the board. Exactly. So tell us some, what can guests do to set themselves up for dining success besides using one of your cards? Well, hey, there's always <laughs> that, but you know, whether you use a card or not, like there's, mm -hmm. this is a tool, but essentially mm -hmm. you need to communicate. And that is, that is rule number one and how you do it is, is really up to you, but it is important that you're getting it out there and you're being clear. And, and that's why like, we, we put, put it on cards. So it's a very clear message. But if you're doing this verbally, it's, it's laying out what exactly you are allergic to. Try not to muddy the waters with wishy-washy language. Like, I'm kind of this, I'm kind of that. Like, just it is, say what it is, it is what it is. Um, and and get, get to the point and just get that information out. And essentially, I, I think it's really important to acknowledge that you might be talking with someone that doesn't have the right info. It might be the 16 year old server that you're dealing with and that's fine, but trying to get to the right person, um, whether you're telling them like, is you might want to 
let the manager know this or the chef, or can I speak to them directly, but I have some pretty severe allergies to, to let you know about. And then they can at least flag the process. Right. And have you, I mean, I'm sure you've gotten pushback from that, but you've also gotten really a lot of people to welcome that conversation. Oh, more and more. And I think it's power in numbers these days versus the early 90s when it was, oh, we've got a, someone with a food allergy here. What do we do? Um, so I think they're used to it. It's it's normalized because there's so many now with dietary restrictions. So uh, it's very rare that I have any type of issue or pushback. If anything, I kind of need to use my gut where if I'm having the young server that I'm not feeling that they've they've got this, uh, I need to be proactive and say, like, I would love to, to talk to the manager just to make sure because you're yeah, yeah, yeah. Answer didn't give me the, the comfort that I need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even last week I was in California and I asked a question about a thing and it was guacamole. And I'm like, I want the mm -hmm. guacamole. He's like, you can't have it. It has gluten in it. I'm like, and I, it was guacamole with yuza, which is a fruit. I'm like, can you, he goes, it's the yuza. And I'm like, yuza is like a mandarin orange. I'm like what? He's like, it's the sauce that we put in it. But I'm like, Okay, that would have been a lot, you know, that would have been a lot more clear conversation than just saying it was the user, right? And, and, and I think this raises a great point. Nobody wants to look like a fool. And everybody, right. you know, it's very common that they want to have the answers for you because that's right. part of their job. But I think, you know, what food service staff need to realize is that we really just want transparency. Right. And we don't want you to have all the answers. We want you to look in the book of ingredients. We want yeah. you to double check. And you don't have to have every single ingredient memorized. No one can do that. Right. And, and that's when you start to run into trouble when someone says, yeah, I think, I think this should be all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you really want to use your gut and, and make sure. Yeah. And I'm, I was, I'm going to pull up a picture because there was another little cute bakery or whatever in the neighborhood. And I liked, and it was all the menu items were written on the board and the chalkboard and whatever. But in the upper right hand corner, it said, if you have any other allergens, please let us know because not all of the ingredients are listed on this board and we want to share them with you. And I thought that was really great Fantastic. You know, because it, it opens up that conversation. I mean, and I noticed it and I'm hoping everybody else with food allergies notices it as well, but it is, I mean, that's opening that conversation. Absolutely. You got to get yeah. it out. Yeah. <clears throat> exactly. Well, when, when you sit down, they start when they're trained to ask you, does anybody at this table have a dietary restriction? Mm -hmm. You know, those type of methods just make it so much easier for a diner to disclose. And, you know, everyone's different in terms of their self-advocacy and confidence. Right. But when when you make it a little bit easier, um, mm -hmm. it helps. But it's also a bit of Pandora's box because it brings out some of these other requests that might not be an allergy, might not be an intolerance, might just be a, right. very, a little bit confusing. So it's right. Exactly. And, and actually that's, I designed my, I teach how to design registration systems for event planners, mm -hmm. like put it under, put CDA, put ADA questions, Americans with Disabilities Act for people, you know, do you have, do you need mobility assistance? Do you need dining assistance? Do you need visually impaired assistance, you know, while you're at this event and how can we help you? And then that's where you ask, do you have food allergies? Do you have celiac? Things like that. Cause it yeah. helps open that question up. Absolutely. Because what you don't want are people muddying the waters with dislikes, right? calling it something else. And then exactly. this, this waters it down for everybody. And um, yeah, and I, I, I don't know why they do that. Maybe they're embarrassed to say they're 40 years old and don't like, don't like a certain food. Um, right. But it's really important that, you know, you're very clear. Right, exactly. So how can we as diners and people with food allergies, how can we influence change in the food service system? Well, one is rewarding places that okay. do a good job. You know, we're a very loyal community, a place as well. We go back. But I think also just to, you know, to verbally give them that feedback that this this was amazing. Um, and not just tip well, but tell them that, that mm -hmm. you really made a difference for making us feel welcome. Uh, leaving reviews that are very pinpointed to why this was such a great place and why they go above and beyond. So I think just to give that feedback is important, but also... Um, I think for our community, it's really important that we're, we're proactive too for the places that aren't so great. And mm -hmm. it's one thing to complain. And I mm -hmm. think 
we 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 all have had eye rolls. We've all had bad experiences, and you know it's it is what it is. But how can we take that and make it positive? Is my okay. question of how can we proactive and mobilize people to address some of the bigger system issues, whether it's uh, restaurants not having allergen information available, restaurants not being trained, and how can we mobilize as an eight percent of the population? And, and actually influence change. Yeah. Well, there's a menu I grab. I went to have lunch with friends of mine a couple last month. And it was funny because it, it was in a brewery, which, okay, breweries have yeast, which is gluten, right? All that. Or they're making beer. But And they had the little logo at the bottom, GF. And the only, it, the labeling, there was only like one thing on the menu that was gluten-free besides their sauces. So all of their sauces for their pulled pork were gluten-free, but none of the pork was labeled gluten-free. I'm like, so I can have the sauce, but I can't have anything else that you serve the sauce with. And I just like, what's the point in putting it on there? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, I want to, you know, go back and just say, Hey, I'm, I'm just really curious about this and not in a complaining way. Just I'm curious, you know, if you're putting the labeling on here and I think the coleslaw was gluten-free, I mean, that was it. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. And, and, and like my, that's a great example of, of taking another step instead of right. just going back home and complaining on social media, but right. like actually being part of a solution because maybe they're just inexperienced overall with mm -hmm. providing accommodations and more options. I know with my, my wife, we go to places where, they have limited options and especially like they have some gluten-free things. Um, but when it comes to pasta, like just to buy some gluten-free pasta and have it in house, she always provides some type of, you know, you, you could, you know, very easily make more money by offering this in a very, very accessible way. So providing some options, some ideas without coming down on them, but working with them it, it can go a long way. And have you, I mean, I'm curious too, with when doing your research and, and talking to the, the chefs and the restaurants and things, have you changed some of their minds in the way they approach this and asked and just asking questions? Uh, I, I think they've become more sympathetic um, to, to the, the plight of, of people with food allergies, especially parents where um, like a good tasting meal isn't always primary to them. It is a mm. safe meal. And I think that was eye-opening to, to food service staff. They take so much pride in what they do, which is wonderful. And I love a good tasting meal as, next to the next, as much as the next person, but safety's first. And, and when you can kind of calm those fears and, and really address that, that route, mm -hmm. then people can let down their guard and really enjoy that food more. So I think yeah. this was eye-opening for them. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's really important. It, and I don't want a bland meal either, but sometimes that's all you get. And, but, but I think being proactive on that restaurant side too, or the culinary catering side or whatever is like, go ahead and, and spend some of your research time creating some meals that actually meet those needs and taste good so that it's not, it's a safe meal and it's tasty. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And another thing, you know, I, I we talked to people that did not have any type of like matrix or ingredient information sure. um, readily available. And, and just when restaurants have that, it's almost a flag to customers that we want to engage with you right. in a conversation, even if it's, I think there was fears, we can't keep it up to date all the time. So yeah, absolutely. There, you have to do some work on it, but just to have it, uh, right opens up at least that dialogue starting point, And that's important. And I think it's important to know too, and, and, and on the updating thing for, for even us as consumers, I'm like, they change the labels, right? Or they change the ingredients sometimes because, and especially now with sourcing, you know, like how did they change it? And, you know, is that label updated? And so we, I'm sure you get label, you know, notifications, hey, there's peanut allergy recall on this or whatever. Um, but that is challenging, especially with restaurants and hotels that have thousands of pieces, different types of food coming in on a daily basis. But I guess if they if they looked at those meals for 
the food allergic, let's just say the food allergic in general, as a scratch kitchen kind of meal versus something that's prepackaged, that would make it a lot easier too. Absolutely. And, you yeah. know, even when a menu says, um, <laughs> tell us, uh, please inform right. your server, like just little things like that might not guarantee, like we have this, this, and this, but it at least gets that conversation going. And that's right, exactly. Important. And so traveling around the world, um, and probably not so much the last two years, but um, what has been the biggest joy in using your cards or, and, and do you see it from the front of the house? You know, a lots of help. Yeah. yeah, I do. And I think it's, it's the, it's the hospitality industry overall. And as mm -hmm. a tourist, they want to be hospitable. They want to accommodate you. And when you're not, clear when you're not speaking their language and you're fumbling through a very serious message uh it's stressful for everybody and mm -hmm. when i use the card it's almost like a sense of relief where there's like oh it, one it's almost like they think it's cool like this right. is accurate in our language versus like a google translate and uh and then it's telling a really important message that they want to know so right. it really facilitates a better conversation when when traveling well, and I think, and just going to your history, if you look at the video on Kyle's website, equaleats.com, you'll see that it was trying to translate the word cashew, Yeah. right? Yeah. You know, and they, the waiter didn't understand what that, what you were trying to say. Exactly. And, you know, with, with all of the different tree nuts out there, um, it's, it's, yeah. And I, it's easy to get lost in translation. And that's exactly what happened. And I got a response of uh, pretty much, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got this, no problem. And um, and I knew it too. Like my gut was saying they don't have it. And I very rarely do I go against my gut. And that mm -hmm. instance, I, I just kind of like, okay, don't make a big deal about it. They've reassured you. And it caused a really serious allergic reaction. And it was just, yeah, it was translation of one nut essentially. Wow. And I remember being in Brazil, uh, speaking in Brazil a couple of years ago and talking to the gentleman who was in charge of the Olympics, the uh, Rio Olympics for the mm -hmm. athletes village. Cool. And Brazil had just actually come out with their allergen labeling and they broke it down instead of saying tree nuts as a whole, they broke it down to every single nut. Like uh -huh. they listed it out because they didn't want it to be confused, which makes it a lot harder, but it also is a lot clearer at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, with our cards, we, we provide customized cards. So you can mm -hmm. choose from, oh my goodness, we have 550 allergens you can choose from. Oh my goodness. Wow. It's okay. massive and growing every week. So, um, but people design their cards differently and we mm -hmm. have, we try to, to give some education of what's best, but some people just prefer saying tree nuts. And for mm -hmm. those that it is very specific, they know they can eat some and some they cannot, they will list out specific tree nuts. So it's very interesting. Every card is certainly different. That's that comes yeah. out of Well, and I'm glad that they're personalized. That's That makes it fun too. Yeah. Um, okay, so one question that I ask everybody, what does a safe, sustainable and inclusive food and beverage experience mean to you? I think it's one where everybody feels comfortable and i think for anyone with a dietary restriction comfortable is a hard a hard target at times so okay. it's it's really a an experience where you feel safe you feel the information's been provided to you that you need you feel welcome and you feel fulfilled at the end of it so at the end of the day it's 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 providing the comfort that gives you confidence to, uh, to dine safely and well. Um, and that, yeah, I mean, because it's, because, and then the sustainability aspect of it is that you're going to come back, right? Absolutely. It's, you know, when you've set that system up, it's, mm -hmm. it's done and then people will come back and they'll tell their friends and things will grow. And I always think, you know, the, the places that cater well to people with dietary restrictions need to be rewarded. It's not easy. It's a more, there are more steps, but it is doable. So mm -hmm. um, absolutely. It needs to be sustainable in that um, it's a cycle of being rewarded for that work. Well, and a Facebook user here says um, that sounds performative to me, like labeling naturally gluten-free things. And I, 
Yes. I mean, I want, and it's, it's confusing too, because when do you want, um, do you want it to list it so that it's gluten free or do you want to list it that it contains gluten? I actually want it to do both, you know, and I, I, I don't want it to be the, the, the back of a, a box. Right. But I want to be able to know that you, you took the time actually on every single buffet item here or menu item to look at it, to make sure that it is one or the other and Absolutely. let me know. Yeah. Okay. So today is special because I have another guest that I want to pop in here and um, her name and I'm going to pull it. Her name is Karen Palmer. Oops. Where did I just go? I lost my screen. Here we go. Um, let's see. Karen Palmer. I want to bring you in here. Woohoo. Hi. Hi, Kyle. Hey, Karen. Good to see you. How, um, hi. Um, so Karen, <laughs> she is an, I, I'm like doing this on the fly, um, is an executive and leadership coach and the owner of Karen Palmer Coaching, but she's also the mom of a, she's a mom of a food allergic daughter. <laughs> and Kyle, I, I wanted to bring on, bring her on here with you too, because her daughter, wait, she's a freshman, Karen, is that right? Just finished her freshman year. Just yeah. Just finished her freshman year. So you having grown up with food allergies since you were two and you went to college Right. Yeah, you know, certainly. what is that? You know, it's transitioning and educating mom. You you got to let the, your baby go and and yeah. fend for herself. And then but you also still want to be your mom. And but there's these things that you want to instill in her. So but it's also being an adult and managing those things, too. Right. Well, I mean, it's, you know, it's a huge adjustment for the entire family, right? I mean, you know, it's, I grew up as a foodie. I loved, you know, eating everything, traveling everywhere, you know, no limits. And, you know, was faced when, you know, our daughter was 13 months old with the knowledge that she was allergic to six of the top eight allergens at wow. that time. And so it required a huge step back in terms of us really thinking through what does it mean? to be able to eat in a way, I, I love what you just said, Kyle, I caught the back you know, portion of your conversation. The idea that a safe meal is more important than the most fabulous meal of your lifetime, because in the end, it doesn't matter how good it is if it endangers your life. And so for us, it was a huge adjustment to how do we make food safe within not just our home, but hopefully a wider environment, you know, so that our daughter could go out and live the kind of fulfilled life we wanted for her but that she would learn how to do that independently because as a parent, you know, at some point, you know, you just got to open the door and let them fly and they have to be able to manage for themselves. I, I think that's so important. And Kyle, as a person who educates students, and I'm sure you're doing it more to elementary schools than to college kids singing, you know, teaching <laughs> uh, them that. The puppets were better. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's 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 instilling it instilling it when they're younger so that they do have that confidence. But it's also you got to hold on. But you, you know, what are those things that you have to teach your kids to do and advocate for themselves when they're going to college? Because yeah. and I would just want to say too that colleges nece not necessarily were the best at doing this in the first place. And we can talk about the Leslie University thing later on. Um, yeah. But Essentially, you know, it's it's tough, but I think you, you got to party proof your your teen um, well in advance and, and be prepared to chaperone on the sidelines, because, you know, when they're young, you're very actively involved in, in managing their food allergies. And then it's a, a gradual shifting of responsibilities where you can't do everything for them, but you need to guide them to be asking about food at a restaurant and checking their own ingredients and and making sure that they're carrying their epinephrine, but um, gradually you're not carrying it for them and you're not having to remind them as well. So when they get to the point where they're leaving the nest, you have to have the, that type of confidence that they can do it by themselves. But as I said before, chaperoning from the sidelines, because I think when you reach that age, when you're a freshman, um, you want to be independent, but are you fully independent yet? Some are, some aren't. So you really need to kind of keep tabs. Um, just check in. How are you doing? Are you telling your roommate? Are you telling uh, your friends to have a plan in place if, you know, a party gets out of control with food and all of this? So staying involved is really important as you're kind of navigating this new transition. 
Yeah, that is so important. I mean, I think, you know, the baseline message here is that, you know, there needs to be a, a support network created that your child can then take and build on for themselves. Um, you know, in the same way that we would say to our kids, you know, um, by the way, if you're at a party and, you know, somebody's had a little bit too much to drink and they're the ones who are supposed mm -hmm. to be driving you home, what are you going to do about that? And you have to have those same kinds of conversations about you feel a reaction coming on, you know, in advance. You want to know that your roommate knows how to help you with, you know, self-injecting if they need to, that your RA knows that you know the specific information you need to keep yourself safe if the worst possible thing happens. Yeah. Well, and it reminds me of, well, let's go back to this view here, of this meeting planner um, in Canada that I met years ago, and she was telling her story. She di got diagnosed with celiac, but she had five emergency room visits in the year after being diagnosed with celiac, and she was allergic to tree nuts at the same time. So, wow. which you know, eating gluten-free, you're using a lot of tree nut flowers, right? But now she always makes sure that she has a buddy, you know, when she has an event, right? And I think we have to rely on, and, and it, it could be the meeting planner, it could be whatever, but I think when you're going to college too, Karen, you just said, is it your roommate? Is it your RA, somebody like that, right? That does have your back. Because I think it's really important to make sure that you have that. Well, you know, the, the biggest thing, I mean, when people say, what's the most important thing you can do to prepare your child to be successful at navigating that transition to dining independently, it's that that process starts long before you start looking at colleges, right? I mean, in middle school, this is when kids start to have the issue of self-carrying um, their, you know, epinephrine auto injectors. And this is also the age where kids are trying to figure out who am I and my friends are more important than my parents and I don't really want to do what my parents are telling me to do. And so there are all these complicated emotional factors that figure into how do I keep myself safe as I start to be out in the community by myself, hanging with friends, being in places where food is a big part of whatever conversation you're having. And so the biggest thing that I can offer to parents is that you need to start supporting and training your kids to be independent and safely independent around food you know, really long before you get to the point of choosing a college. And that means, you know, making sure that they know how to, you know, carry and use their auto, you know, I've been ever auto injectors correctly, that they actually know and start asking the questions, you know, resist that impulse that when you go to the restaurant together, that you talk to the waiter for them, make them do it. Because when they get to the point where it's automatic, they won't be as likely to forget, but it has to be second nature. I think having a 13 year old or a 14 year old talk to the waiter saying, Hey, I have food allergies while you, while mom and dad are sitting there. I think that to me would say to a wait, waiter or waitress, you know, Hey, this kid knows who they are. Right. And they're not relying on mom and dad, but mom and dad are there to back them up at the same time. But I think that would be even more empowering to me as the kid. Right. It really shows that they own it at that point. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And speak for themselves, right? And I think, you know, the other thing, I mean, because again, we know that it's often difficult for kids to do this within a group of their own peers. If they have the practice of doing it with you as backup, number one, it cues the healthcare professionals, as you just said, you know, and, you know, the, the folks who are supervising this dining experience that this is somebody who understands their body, but it also means that they get over that awkwardness, at least in one situation before they have to start doing it in front of their friends, which is going to be harder for them. Right, exactly. So how do you, Karen, how, what is the most important things? I mean, you may have just said it, but preparing them early, but important thing that families can do to prepare their kids to go to college and dine safely, because there's a lot of food. There's fraternity parties and sorority parties and dining halls and and whether your university requires you to eat on the campus, re eat the dining plan, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, that is, I think, the most important thing, the idea that they are, you know, as comfortable as they can possibly be with being their own best advocate. Your voice is always going to be the voice that controls how well the experience goes. You know, you have to use it. But in addition, we touched on this before, the idea that you need to create your own network around you of people who know what your situation is, 
people can help you, you know, if you know you have a reaction and it progresses very quickly and you need support and being able to self-administer your, you know, auto injector, somebody who can help, you know, call 911, whatever it is, that everyone around you needs to be aware of, you know, the situation you might be in and how they can best support you. And that includes the dining, you know, service professionals that you start interacting with. I mean, mm -hmm. My daughter's allergist gave her a great piece of advice when she started looking at schools and, you know, she wanted to know, like, what should I be thinking about when I think about where I want to go to school? And he said, think about going where you want to go, but find out the information that you want along the way. And when you commit to a school, the first call you need to make is to the university's, you know, Office of Disabilities, which supports students who have any kind of disability condition. And, you know, it's important for families to realize Food allergy is a recognized disability because it does limit one or more of your core life activities. So that's the first call you make once you accept because you want them to know, you know, you may need special accommodations. That's where you can have certain questions answered. Am I required to have a meal plan? You know, how are you going to be prepared to accommodate and work with me? Uh, because we understand food service folks, they have to, they have to serve thousands of people every day. And mm -hmm. not everyone is as well educated as we would like. So the onus is always on the student, who, by the way, at this point is likely to be over 18 and a legal adult. It's always going to be on the student to be the person who does the lead advocacy. And as Kyle pointed out, we as parents, you know, and support can be there in the background. But the Office of Disabilities wants to hear from your student. The executive chef, the general manager in the dining hall wants to hear from your student. They don't really want to work through you as the parent because you're not going to be there. That's such a good point. I mean, you want the independence. And so here we're giving you that independence and you have, this is your first step in kind of owning it outside of living at home. Right. Yeah. 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 Kyle, did you step. learn I mean, anything? Or go ahead, Karen. No, no. I just said, I was curious, you know, Kyle, I don't know what your experience was, but um, you know, I think, that, you know, the biggest thing is getting over that fear of, you know, that I, you know, that there's something wrong with me and I don't want to have to, you know, expose that to strangers. And it's called, you know, this is, this is the core of your life. There's nothing wrong with you. This is a health condition you have that has to be actively managed and you need support in doing that. Yeah. And, and as you said, Karen, I think those years, well, leading to, to college are just vital to, to build that confidence of, of kids. So when they get to that point, it's not like this flicking a switch, like good luck out there. Because I think this the college years are really identif um, where you, you form your identity as an adult. You, you, you are making your own independent decisions of who you are, who you want to be, who you want to hang out with. And it's an influential time where you could be influenced even on how you manage your food allergies. And I, I just remember for myself, it was, you know, a, a completely new social circle, very different and it influenced me on being more of a risk taker than I had previously been as a teenager. And for me, I, I paid the consequences through having a really severe reaction by trying to be cool. And it, it was essentially just not being grounded enough in my own self-management and confidence with my allergies that led to it that, you know, one risk led to another because it was college and you try new things, right? So I'd say those years leading up to it and, and then guiding as well throughout the college years is really important for all parents. That's, I mean, because, and you, you, then you throw in alcohol and, and all of that stuff too, right? That adds a whole nother level of it as well. And it it is because you, you want to figure out where you want to go and maybe your your degree is going to change over the course of four years, but your food allergies are not right. No, there's they're with you, right? You, but you're you don't need to know what you, the rest of your life is planned out when you graduate from college. But you do need to accept for the fact that you have to manage these food allergies. Yeah, and that's you know it's why the preparation is so important. It's you know first as we've just discussed, preparing yourself in terms of attitude and your need to be your own best. You know fullest advocate, but then also, you know, reaching out to people and getting information that's going to support this transition for you. Like, you know, for, you know, if you call the disabilities office, connect with them, figure out what kind of accommodations would be most appropriate for you. Do you need a medical single? Is the allergy severe enough that you don't feel you can trust 
dining services and that you might want to be able to cook for yourself. Not all colleges can necessarily accommodate that. And right. that is something for people to keep in mind that accommodations mean different things based on where you're going to school and how the school is set up. So it behooves you to do that homework in advance. Things that we started thinking about from hearing from other families with college students, um, you know, think about where's the closest hospital? Um, you know, do the ambulances that serve that area carry epinephrine on board in case yours runs out before you get to, uh, you know, Safe Harbor? Um, are there places where you can buy safe food nearby if you want to prepare a meal or you need to pick something up? Um, you know, safe food means different things for everybody. Sometimes it means having a supermarket nearby or you're fortunate enough to be able to eat at a particular fast food place that observes protocols that work for you. But knowing that sometimes you may need options beyond what the dining hall can offer because maybe the dining hall closed early one day or you slept too late to get breakfast. So it's really about looking at your entire environment and thinking, here's what I have set up at home. How can I create a safe environment that you know, mimics as much of what I have at home when I go away to school? I love that, Karen. It, it totally reminds me of a meeting planner going on a site visit and choosing a property for their event and including asking about the EMTs because not all, even though 36 states allow to have epinephrine on property, majority of the hotels out there aren't going to have it, but does an EMT have it, you know, not all EMTs are allowed to carry it, right? Or administer it. So asking where that hospital is, what the, re, you know, but how can, how do we create that inclusive experience? Can this hotel do this for the people who we are bringing in that have different dietary restrictions? Yeah, this is, I mean, you know, I love that you brought that up because the inclusivity is something that, again, we have learned by experience not to expect because not everybody understands the nature of food allergy. And frankly, not mm -hmm. everyone is supportive. Food allergy is an invisible disability. And so if you're looking at someone who looks, you know, 100% healthy, young, fabulous, and they're not presenting to you in a way that implies that they're in crisis, you may not get the immediate help that you need unless you are very clear about advocating for it. My daughter had an anaphylactic reaction, um, you know, again, not through an on-campus dining service, but from an off-campus restaurant and noted, it, you know, self-administered, called, had appropriate support around her. But then when she got to the ambulance, the guys didn't want to transport her because she looked fine. And she what? had to basically get up in their faces and say, I know the law. I know what you're required to do. I'm having a health you know, event and you need to take me to the hospital because I need to be observed. And, you know, eventually they did, she got there. But she had to be the ones to tell them this is how this is supposed to go. There are and stories I've heard from other families where, again, many ERs, you know, when they know that someone's coming in and they need that support, they want to administer Benadryl first. And the bottom line is Benadryl does not stop a systemic reaction. All right. it does is mask the symptoms. So your child needs to know, hey, I know what the procedure is. I need to epi first, epi fast. I need to stop this reaction in my body so that I can be safe. But they may be the ones that have to advocate for that to happen. And so when I talk about preparing kids so that it's literally in their DNA that they know what to do. You never know when you're going to be called to do it. Right, exactly. And, oh, I, I, that story just blows my mind. Your daughter um, sounds amazing. Yeah. Uh, you know what? We've had a great village and <laughs> I, I cannot stress this enough. Um, I think about Kyle, the population that you're serving, which is largely kids in the, you know, the K-12 environment. and. You know, for us, I remember the early days of looking for a preschool and, you know, this is New York City. I mean, where you practically have to have your kids go through interviews to find a spot <laughs> in the preschool. But we had to give up on several places right away because we said, what's your plan for supporting kids with food allergies? My kid has a food allergy action plan. And their plan was, well, the school nurse is here on Wednesdays and Fridays. And I said, oh, so that's not really a plan because if my kid has an anaphylactic reaction on Thursday, we're in trouble. Um when we eventually found a place, uh, it was that, you know, the director said to us, our plan is we take your plan and we discuss it with you and we figure out how do we best support your child. And we want you to educate us because we know we don't know a lot. So we know how fortunate we were. And I think, again, this is 20 years later. I think people are far more sophisticated than they once were. 
about what food allergies mean in a classroom context, because what is it, one out of every 13 kids now mm -hmm. has a food allergy. So right. if you've got a class with 26 kids in it, it's likely that two of them are going to have a food allergy. Um, it really is that idea that the village is necessary. We had supportive friends. We had supportive family. We used the services of a food allergy counselor when my daughter was making that transition to self-caring and dealing with all of the complicated feelings that come with now being the different one in my social group. And I would totally you know, recommend that if people are seeing that they need additional support, that you know they find a food allergy counselor in their area. And there's a wonderful website called foodallergycounselor.com yep. uh, run by uh, Tamara Hubbard, who is a, a licensed therapist. Um, I, we haven't had the pleasure of meeting, but I have referred people to her site when they needed outside support. Because, you know, a lot of times there are people who have family members who aren't particularly mm -hmm. supportive. You know, maybe you exactly. have an auntie who's really attached to the favorite dish that she makes for Thanksgiving. And you as the 13 year old don't feel comfortable going to her and saying, auntie, could you not make that so I can come to Thanksgiving dinner? Right. So sometimes we need support that's outside the family that allows, you know, the kid who's growing up to feel like I have a place to put all my stuff on the table. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So I, I know, Kyle, you have a hard depart right now, right? I'd so, love <laughs> and he, he's like seven hours ahead of us in, oh, in Europe. Wow. So it is. Um, thank you so much for being here. And thank you for doing what you do. And everybody, um, I'm posting his website here, Equal Eats. You can um, find his app and his cards there and on social media and all of those platforms, right? Same Absolutely. Name. I'm around. Yeah. Thank you so <laughs> much for being you here. Take care. Right. Nice right. to see you. You all too. Right. Bye. Bye. Okay. I know a lot um, of people who use Kyle's cards. They're amazing. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> they are. And the fact that he translates it into more than 30 different countries or languages is, is mind blowing. And, it's hugely and, important because again, we live in a world where people mm -hmm. travel and you know, this is the other thing. We don't want our kids to feel like I have to have a limited life. I have to have a limited perspective because I'm managing a health condition. Yes, it's right. serious. It's potentially life-threatening. But the bottom line is they deserve to have the fullest life possible. And we have so many more tools now to allow them to do it. Yes. You know, very, things very like true. that are a huge, huge support. Exactly. And, and just think that your daughter would be you know, as a sophomore or junior going off and doing a study abroad. I mean, those cards would be a huge benefit for her wherever she chooses yes. to go, right? She's already had the experience of, you know, again, as a middle schooler going on a class trip to Spain, you oh, know, wow. again, a prospect mm -hmm. that terrified my husband and I, because, you know, we'd never had her away for more than, you know, I mean, like <laughs> a couple of nights. And then to be, you know, in, overseas in a place mm -hmm. where, you know, again, no opportunity for us to be pleasant. And every single meal was eaten in a restaurant or at a hotel. And the thing wow. that was amazing about that experience, because again, mm -hmm. we activated the village. You know, her teachers were all aware. Her closest friends knew how to support her if was necessary. But the thing about being in Europe at that point, she said, mom, all the menus were marked. Mm -hmm. You know, I was able to talk to people about what my needs were. She said it was easier to eat there at that point than it was to eat here in her own community at home, which well, and that's, was a little sad. <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. And that, everybody, if you don't know, it was the EU 1169, which I mentioned on, I think, Thursday or Monday or both, um, which requires all, they require, just like here in the U.S., that packaged food be labeled. Yes. But it requires, in 2014, this was instituted, that all unpackaged food, even the food at a quick trip gas station, has to have you have, they have to be able to provide the allergen information about the food, which I think mm -hmm. is awesome. No, yeah. it, it's, um, I think it's hard for people, again, who don't have to manage this kind of health condition to understand how profoundly it impacts daily life. I mean, there is no casual interaction with food. My daughter has never looked at any particular food she encountered as necessarily being safe. Because even if you've eaten something at the same restaurant or eaten the same brand, you know, more than once, many times, there's no guarantee that the next time you eat it, it'll be safe because mm -hmm. there's always the possibility of cross contact in a restaurant or a food service kitchen. 
Uh, manufacturers in this country are not required to label for allergens. It's a voluntary program, which we hope, mm -hmm. you know, through advocacy will change. Um, but again, they have to have a completely different perspective about how they interact with food, which governs almost every aspect of interaction with people. <laughs> A hundred percent. And then, you know, I mentioned going abroad, but, you know, getting an internship or working in a, you know, getting hired somewhere, that's a whole nother interaction as well. You know, going because you're, you're 18 or even when you're 16, right. Getting, you're getting yeah. your first job and sure. whether Camp it's in a fast food. Yeah. <laughs> oh, true. Yeah. Camp counselors or working in a fast food joint. Right. Yeah. And yeah. We, I think that that's really, really important. And there was one question that we were talking about before the show, but it's like, what's one thing that people might not think to consider when going to college? And was that the EMT thing or was that I mean, something there were a couple totally of things. Yeah. The EMT thing for one, I mean, you know, again, because I think we make the assumption that, you know, ambulances carry everything that we might need for any kind of medical emergency. Right. And that's just not true. So, you know, forewarned is forearmed if you know uh, this is why you want to have two sets of auto injectors with you all the time, because, you know, sometimes the ambulance doesn't get there quickly and you need to be prepared, you know, if you need a second dose, you know, to be able to go and, you know, administer right. again for yourself. But things like thinking about food outside the cafeteria, like, you know, in college, friends want to be able to socialize off campus from time to time. Have you checked out restaurants in the area? Have you actually spoken to people who work there so that you have a degree of comfort that these are people who actually understand what my needs might be. Is mm -hmm. there a supermarket close to the campus? So, you know, again, if all dining options are off and you, need, you just need to grab something quick that you might be able to eat so you're not hungry all night, um, you know, or if you need to be on campus during a time when the dining halls are closed, that you right. have options in terms of things to eat. So it's really about trying to figure out, does this environment have what I need to exist, not just on the regular day-to-day -day basis, but if anything deviates from the norm. Right. And I don't know why this just popped into my head, but with COVID, you know, that and in food insecurity as well. And, and our friend, Emily Brown and the yes. food equality initiative. I mean, there's not a lot of food um, pantries out there that serve individuals that have food allergies and dietary restrictions. And I know that there's some stats from colleges that, a large percentage of students are food insecure Absolutely. and that's a whole nother level of that. We didn't even bring into this conversation until I just thought about it, you know, even pre talk about it, but it, I mean, that's a whole nother aspect to think about too. It's why it is important um, to have this conversation start early. I was privileged enough to conduct a panel on, you know, dining with food allergies, which is, you know, on the web at Food Equality Initiatives YouTube channel. And I encourage uh -huh. people who want to learn more about college dining to go look that up and find it uh, because we spoke to Amelia Smith and Caroline Moassisi from FACT, which is the Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Connection Team, a wonderful support organization for all things food allergy and anaphylaxis. They have an amazing college resource center also on the FACT website, uh, which is foodallergyawareness.org. Um, Caroline mm -hmm. put that together. It, it you know, answers so many questions that parents might have and that students might have about how to create the support network you want. But um, you know, really to hear these folks talk about this in the video that, that FEI put up, it's that personal, you know, touch because there are all kinds of things you often don't think to ask. And mm -hmm. one of the people who participated in that discussion is a recent college graduate who was able to share her personal experience, um, which really opened our eyes to some of the things that often we don't as the adults think about. It's um, super important if your student has the opportunity to connect with other uh, students who've you know, gone through this process. Mm -hmm. And so if you can find a support group through FACT or another food allergy advocacy organization, recommend that. Um, you know, really, you know, knowledge is power. And this is a situation right. where, you know, as much knowledge as you have, that's going to position you to be the most successful with the experience. Um, well, and I love that because and then, you know, through FAIR as well, there's the allergy support groups around the country. I know mm -hmm. they're for a lot of moms, but those moms in those cities could be good supports for those kids if you need them, you know? No. Yeah. And I, I mean, believe, you know, both with, FACT and FAIR run yeah. teen, mm -hmm. you know, uh, retreats exactly. so that there are opportunities for folks yep. to you know, get together and meet in person. Right. Uh, 
kind of have a different level of comfort and frankly ability to attend those things now because those involve right. spending money. But you right. can find resources online through those organizations now uh, in a way that you couldn't when you know mm -hmm. we were you know at the beginning of our process. And I am really heartened by the fact that there is so much more information out there for students and their families right. now to make this a successful experience. Sorry if that came out. I was trying to find that video and it went in my ear. Um, <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't want it to play. I just want to find it and post it. Um, well, and that's, and, and, and I know there's Snack Safely that's got a list of colleges as well. Yes. I mean, and so there are those resources out there and it is definitely not that a medical person, the, the school, um, disability office probably can't give the names of students without their permission, but they can say, Hey, let's put this, this group together. And I think that's a great idea because yeah. you want them school. You're trying to convince this kid to come to your school. And that would be a really good way to convince them. Right. Well, I think if the they have the good great resources is that, you know, again, you know, you're right. They can't just volunteer information, but right. some schools, you know, offer, students the opportunity to, you know, go on a roommate, you know, matching right. board or service where mm -hmm. you can say, here's what I'm looking for in a roommate. And you might be able to say, I have a food allergy. I'd love to be matched with someone who has the same allergy or at least, uh, you know, a knowledge and a willingness to work yeah. with me mm -hmm. in terms of personal space, especially if you want to be assigned to a unit that has a kitchen and, you know, maybe they don't have singles with access to kitchens. Maybe it has to be a, a group experience. But being able to do that in advance is a huge thing. So again, the Office of Disabilities can't be the thing that does it all for you. They're the legal right. place where your information resides, but they are not going to advocate for you directly in the way that you need to do for yourself. And so you need to talk to them, but then you need to start building your own network of support. So what was the, what was the biggest challenge with you and your daughter in, in doing this transition? I mean, was there a challenge or, you know, in oh, sure. and saying, okay, you, <laughs> with any teenager. Shutting right? up and letting her drive. That was the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, it's easy to say as a parent, yeah, I'm going to let you handle this. I mm -hmm. trust you. And I did trust her. I mean, you know, my daughter has never known a world where food was completely safe. You know, she had her first anaphylactic reaction at 13 months. And wow. so I did not... You know, I was just always in a place, my husband was always in a place where we had to be, as Kyle put it, that support from the sidelines. Mm -hmm. um, but in order for your child to be successful with this experience, you have to be willing to step back and say, all right, you know, my role is to follow up, to check in, to make sure you're doing what you need to do. Did you call the Office mm -hmm. of Disabilities? Did you get the paperwork? You know, have you found out what's going on as far as the roommate search? Um, mm -hmm. You know, you want to go to this restaurant? Did you call ahead? You know, it's a fine line when you have an adult level child and you don't want to be a nag, but you also want to make sure that at a time when their focus is going to be on making new friends and having new experiences, that they're supporting themselves in the safest way possible right. to do right. that well. And one thing I know I've forgotten here that is super critical is um, you as a parent may still be paying their health insurance because we all know they can still mm -hmm. be on your insurance till 26. Most kids are not paying independently for insurance. Um, there are legal papers that you need to fill out in advance of oh, wow. know, them enrolling in college. So, for example, if they end up in the hospital as a result of an anaphylactic reaction and they're over 18, you don't have any right to their to information, get the information. signed mm -hmm. a FERPA release. So that release, <laughs> F-E-R-P-A, those are the initials. I cannot remember um, exactly what they stand for, but it allows you to basically be part of their universe of information so that the hospital can contact mm -hmm. you and can share. You also need to have them sign um, a healthcare power of attorney and um, you know, a durable power of attorney in the event that you know they are not able to advocate for themselves and that you need to step in and be that full legal support. So three things. So, um, yeah. Oh, that's huge. Gotta get it done before they go. Wow. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's, we don't think about it because we're used to thinking about them as our kids, right? Right. But your yeah. kid is a legal adult. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you no longer have access to their information. And right. the college or university cannot help you unless you have put all of that into place. Well, and my aunt, on a, I was dealing with that with my cousin, who is like 45 years old and had, an, you know, had surgery and it went bad. But 
Ooh, but he didn't have any of that in place, right? So yeah. she's advocate. It it took some time. So oh my gosh, Karen, that is huge. Thank you for saying that. I mean, because yeah. you don't think about that. And even if you are, <coughs> excuse me, even if you are um, an adult and married, right? You need to make sure that, and and you're going on a business trip. Does your company know who your emergency contact is and event planners? Are you asking who is that emergency contact? Because if I have any any attendee, you should have that information for, right? No. Especially in the day and age. But food allergic person or a diabetic person, what information do you have so that you can let their their family members know that they're in the hospital for that reason, right? Absolutely. I mean, again, I, I can't say it enough. Knowledge is power. Information is power. Right. Are, are they still wearing their medic alerts, mm -hmm. you know, IDs or, you know, whatever brand you use? You still need to have some form of, you know, uh, indication on your person because it can, there's no guarantee that if something happens, that you're going to be on your campus or with someone that who knows mm -hmm. you to be able to tell people who you are. So, right. you know, 95% of healthcare responders are going to look for a bracelet or a necklace or something that might give them information about whatever health condition you have. And so right. as a food allergic person of any age, you're doing yourself a favor by making that information easily accessible for any healthcare provider who might need to assist you. Ah, oh, that is just brilliant. I mean, I, it's, it's such a thing that you don't think about and, and it, and we, we probably all never thought about it in general, right? So you have to make sure that you've got that. It's just that extra step. And especially in, in important when you're they're still on your insurance. Yeah. I yeah. mean, one thing I do want to stress, because I think, you know, again, this is so much information. And, you know, yeah. immediately a lot of folks, we go to the worst case scenario because right. we're afraid of letting go. And, you know, it, it's letting our kids go off and, and do all this stuff. But we are in, I can't say this enough either, a much better universe than we were 20 years ago. I mean, we've had legal steps in the direction that, again, support the idea that food allergy is a legally recognized disability. Right. Um, you know, it can be accommodated. You know, there have been, you know, uh, legal decisions like the Leslie University settlement that said universities actually do need to modify meal plans to accommodate people with food allergies. You know, at Ryder University, they had a settlement that said, the university itself must be responsible for making those accommodations. You can't rely on a third party outside vendor to do that. So you can't blame the vendor if something went wrong. The university is responsible for that. And I believe there was a settlement at one of the SUNY schools um, uh -huh. that says, if you are, you know, again, your you know, medical team, you know, if you decided that, you know, your allergic condition is severe enough that a medical single room needs to be provided at no additional cost. So, you know, again, you're going to have to pay for it, whatever the single would cost. But the bottom line is you can't be upcharged right. for your medical condition. And so there are advances that have been made. Are they as much as we would like? Are they fully supported? No. Mm -hmm. But better off than we were. And, you know, people are pushing for improvements every day. And, and I'm glad that you brought up those other two um, because it is the 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 Leslie University case was the biggest one you know the very forefront of that and and it required it said that the students had to eat on campus for the dining meals and right. but they weren't making accommodations and so the students went to the justice department and that was a huge turning point and and I do like the fact that um, you said the Ryder University it's like mm -hmm. the university itself is not they have to make sure that it's being adhered to even though they are hiring a third party company to, to serve the food and beverage, yeah. they have to put no, the I standards agree. down and say, this is what we want. And that to me, that actually is huge for workplace environments. Like, Hey, you're, you're hiring this company to come in and feed your, your employees. You have to have the same standards. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's just huge. you don't want to be in a place where you feel like somebody's going to pass the buck if something happens. I mean, right. We all understand as, you know, food allergy families and people who work with food allergies that there is no guarantee of safety under any conditions because, you know, cross contact can be as random as the restaurant doesn't serve items with nuts in them. But, you know, somebody had a granola bar on their break and forgot to wash their hands before they picked up someone's order to bring it into the dining room. 
you know, the weapons that we have to fight against food allergy, which, you know, there's no cure for at this point, are education and constant vigilance. And if we employ both of those, we can also get to the third place, which is understanding and support from our community. That's awesome. Okay, so to wrap this up, the question that I ask everybody is, what <laughs> does a safe, sustainable, and inclusive dining food food and beverage experience mean to you? And you could put it in the context of college mm. universities or just in general. Well, I think in general, I mean, because this applies just as much in, in the universe that you work in, you know, of, you know, the larger food service um, community is it's an experience where everyone who is involved has the information they need to make the dining experience as safe and enjoyable as possible. So that means the diner has information that allows them to choose whether or not this is an environment where I can eat safely and where the kitchen staff and you know anyone who is involved in you know handling and preparing the food has the information they know in order to make sure that they can prepare food in a way that is not going to expose diners to risk. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it, it is, and it goes back to that statement that you reiterated from Kyle. It's like, we want to just, we want to be safe. And in the end is like, we don't want to die. And we don't want to go to the hospital, right? And, yeah. and, and we do. So I think somebody said it the other day. It's like, we don't, ex we don't expect this big, huge hoopla, <sighs> right, of a meal. We just want to make sure that we've got something to eat. Yeah. That's and, safe. you know, I think something that in, yeah, I'm sure you've encountered this in, in food service, something that I think is really, it, it makes the light bulb go off for a lot of people is I've said to folks, if you offer a safe experience, a, a friendly, welcome experience to, you know, people with food allergies, they will become the most loyal customers you have mm -hmm. ever had. They will tell everybody where they've been. They will encourage you to go. This is a market segment that I think that people from a business perspective really have not exploited for their own benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yep. it is more of a challenge. You have to think a little harder about what to do it. But there are plenty of people who are doing it successfully. Uh, and, you know, folks who are interested can do a little research and find, you know, where are the restaurants that have made this a cornerstone of what they do? Where right. are the food service environments who are really successful? And there are a number of them who are functioning in places like college campuses, you know. Everyone is not equally successful. And again, that message to your you know, new students, when you're in the line and you see somebody using the same spatula to flip your supposed hamburger and they stick it under a cheeseburger on another grill, you know that's something mm -hmm. where you have to be able to go to the manager on duty and say, hey, I just saw something that actually could make me sick. Can we talk about this? And you know, can steps be taken to make sure mm -hmm. it doesn't happen again? Yep. So it's really about education because we can't assume that the person who is the line cook is going to know what the executive mm -hmm. chef or the general manager in any facility knows. Anytime you see something, you know, like they say here in New York about the subways, you got to say something. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Karen, thank you so much for being mm -hmm. here. I'm so excited to have you. And, oh, thank you, Tracy. and you're welcome to be the final guest on um, Food Allergy Awareness Week. Um, it's been a really educational week and <laughs> with, with so many different things to think about. And, and it's just, it's, it's what you just said. It's, it's education and awareness and we all, we all have to eat and we all want to eat safely. Yeah. So. No, I thank you so much for the invitation. I think it's great that you've had this whole week to focus and to introduce people who may not know a lot about the situation our families mm -hmm. face. Um, but really also to help build that spirit of community for a health condition that is not well understood, I think, by the general public and often not supported in the way that we would like to see it. So anytime we can build potential allies and, you know, raise consciousness, you know, that's some place that I know both of us want to be. So thanks to everybody exactly. who's listening today. Yes. Thank everybody who's listening today and, and all week long. And these videos are on the Thrive YouTube channel, the Thrive Facebook page. Um, they will be on the Thrive website as well. So um, thank you for tuning in. Um, thank you for wanting to create safe, sustainable, and inclusive food and beverage experiences. Um, until next time, stay safe and eat well. The next episode will be in five days on Wednesday, our normal day at 12 o'clock. And I actually have Gwen Smith from Allergic Living Magazine, um, who is my guest. And 
um, talk about what she's seen over the course of running that magazine, you know, in this industry, um, along with celiac disease. So, oh, that's a must. That Gwen yeah, I know <laughs> she is amazing. She really, really is. Um, and then another Canadian, her and Kyle. I'm excited. <laughs> Well, you can learn a lot from what's happening in Canada. So, you know, I will look forward to that episode myself. Well, thank you. And I look forward to staying in touch with you um, and everybody. I think I already put it on there. Karen Palmer, if you can want to, her LinkedIn profile is down there. I will make sure I do it one more time. But um, until next time, everybody stay safe and eat well. Thanks. Thank you. You all enjoy your weekend. Thanks, Karen. And stay with me. You stay with me.